think understanding the difference between danger and fear is really important. They're not synonymous. Danger is just a thing. Fear is your reaction. And they don't have to be the same thing. Chris Hatfield, what an honor to meet you. Oh, it's a delight to meet you. <laughs> Can you tell us a little bit about what it feels like to watch the Earth from space? The flying a spaceship is busy. Like, it's just, there's so many things going on. You have to keep the ship healthy, all the experiments, all the work that's going on, talking to everybody on Earth. But meanwhile, you're going around the world every 92 minutes. And the world is turning underneath you. So every time you come around, it's a new path around the world. And, and half the time, if that's the sun over there, half the time you're in the darkness. So you get night, day, night, day. You get a sunrise. You get a sunset every 46 minutes. And, and the world is constantly being changed by the weather. So it's, it's like it's being washed and rinsed and refreshed every time you come around. And the first time you look at the world, it's overwhelmingly beautiful. There's so many things to see that you can't, you can't even focus on them. All you can really see is what you were prepared to see, the stuff you recognize. I mean, you look at all of Europe, and all you can see is, oh, look, there's London. OK, London, hey, something. there's, <laughs> there's Paris. Look, down, OK, that's, that's Madrid. I can see where Madrid is there. OK, and there on the coast. I can see Barcelona. That's lovely, right there. I can't get, <laughs> but the next time you come around, you go, oh, good, there's London, there's Paris, but look, so that's the Thames estuary. And then the next time you come around, well, there's the Severn. And the next time, well, that must be where Stonehenge is. And then you can maybe look for old Roman roads. or you, Suddenly, you start to see the world with a, a clarity that, that we've never been able to see before. And the whole thing in 90 minutes. So not just the place that you're familiar with, but everywhere, all 7.5 billion people and all four and a half billion years of the Earth's history is laid out underneath you like uh, an endless gift. And so astronauts, we're busy on the ship, but, um, but you can't help but constantly try and get to the window and see what's underneath you. Yeah. Uh, it, it's, it is unremittingly beautiful and, uh, and extremely thought provoking to see the world that way. It sounds incredible. Hmm. Which brings me to my next question about your first time. What was it like the day that you said, today I'm leaving Earth? So how well would you sleep on the night before you were leaving Earth? <laughs> you know, you go to bed the night before thinking, tomorrow is going to be a pretty special day. But I, but I had been prepared for it. I, I decided to be an astronaut when I was just turning 10. I'd been training for it. I'd learned to fly as a teenager. I'd been in the Air Force. I'd become an engineer. I was a test pilot, all these things. And then I'd been training as an astronaut for several years. So it was a big day, but it was also a day that I was ready for. So I slept fine the night before. Got up that, <laughs> that, that morning of launch. Um, you get all the briefings, the last minute changes and all those things. And then they start building your, your suit around your body because you have to wear a pressure suit just in case the spaceship pops a leak. Mm -hmm. You don't want all the air to get sucked out and everybody dies. So you actually wear a, like a rubber lined suit. So if the spaceship had a leak, then it would blow up around you like a balloon and you'd still be OK. So you start, they build this suit around your body, get it all tested and everything working. It's big and heavy and hot and uncomfortable. and. It's, it's almost like you can hear time passing, because you know that a big thing's about to happen. And all of these steps are going on, but they're steps building towards something. And uh, you, everyone's dressed. The suits are bright orange, so that if you had to jump out of the space shuttle, uh, they could find you in the ocean. So you're all wearing these, we call them pumpkin suits, um, sort of like this chair, bright orange suits. Uh, and. We walk down the hall, we ride the elevator, you walk out, there's a thousand people there and lights flashing and all this hoopla. You get in the van and it starts taking you out to the launch pad. It's, it's in Florida at the Kennedy Space Center. It's several miles, so there's time. We're talking and laughing and, you know, um, anticipatory. The best moment is you come around the corner and in the distance for the first time down the long causeway, you can see your spaceship sitting on the launch pad. It's not a spaceship, it's your spaceship. 
and you drive that last distance, we all get out at the bottom. No one's anywhere near it because it's so much high explosive. People are at least five kilometers away. You get in the elevator, we all ride up in the elevator, and, uh, and then one by one, you get on your hands and knees and crawl into the spaceship, get around in your seat, lying on your back. Someone's there to cinch up all of your straps and hook up all the uh, oxygen and communications and all the connections. And then they, um, they give you a little kiss on the forehead, give <laughs> maybe a note from your spouse. Um, mm. And then uh, they close the hatch and you're alone in the ship. And we do pressure checks, we do communications checks, the clock is ticking, everyone has to get everything cleared away. You know, it takes a couple hours. You're lying there on, the back, on your back, but the clock is getting closer and closer. You'd think you might be afraid, but you're not. You're ready. Your only real fear is that they're not gonna let us go today. You know, like it's gonna be <laughs> bad weather or, or maybe in the, in the restricted part of the ocean where our boosters are going to fall. Maybe you know a sailboat is going to go in there, and then they're like, "You can't launch till we get the sailboat out of there." That's your biggest fear, because you're ready for the for the power of what's about to happen. But you also you deny it, because I've been dreaming of this day since I was nine years old, and here it is, 26 years later, and I've never counted on this day to come. I've never wow. I've never allowed myself to think that okay. I'm never really going to get to fly in space. But now you're so close and the clock is within 10 minutes and now five minutes. And, and it's like, wow, maybe we're actually going to go to space today. How cool is that? And, um, and you're watching the talk at 30 seconds. Uh, the vehicle is completely separate from Earth. It, it, it's running on its own systems. Uh, at about six seconds, the, we start to light the engines. You're, everyone's so focused on all of the instruments, make sure everything works perfectly. And then as T hits zero, the huge rockets, the solid rockets light, and there's this enormous pulse of power through the vehicle, like, like something that just dwarfs who you are, the, the enormity of the, of the explosions that are going on around you. And yet you're safe in this little central cocoon. Like suddenly a tornado has just wrapped itself around you and you're there in the middle. Uh, and it starts to hurl you up off the pad. Enormous wow. force in, your, in, in the small of your back. Big vibration. The tower drops away, the, the launch tower. By the time we clear the tower, we're going 100 miles an hour straight up Oof. and accelerate. Go through the speed of sound in 45 yeah. seconds. You go faster than the Concorde in a minute and a half. And, and it's violent, and you're crushed and shaken. You can't even yeah. focus on the instruments. And then after two minutes, you're above the air. The big solid rockets that have, that have dragged you above the atmosphere, they're out of fuel. They explode off, and the vehicle's enveloped in flame. And now it's smooth, because you just have your hydrogen engines. But it gets heavier and heavier and heavier as you're accelerating harder and harder. And you watch the, the speed. It's just, it, we go speed of sound, and, and one, one mock is the speed of sound times one, and, and you go through Mach 2 and Mach 3 and Mach 4 and Mach, Mach 20, Mach 21, Mach, and it's unbelievable speed, and yet that's happening on your Mach yeah. meter. And then the sky has gone from light blue to dark blue to black. Yeah. And finally at the end of it, after you just about had all you could take, being crushed, takes about eight and a half minutes, where you're just tired of having to push your chest forward to breathe, suddenly the vehicle has done its job, you're at the right speed and altitude, perfectly the right direction, and the engine shut off, and you're weightless. And it, you're both there, it's, it's over, yeah. you've done the hard part, yeah. but it's also just beginning. Yeah. Now the whole thing, you now have permission to yeah. truly go do what you were there for. It's an amazing nine minute ride. It takes your life from a place you've only dreamed of to an entirely new realm of opportunity, a new reality just as the result of the incredible ingenuity and capability and power of the things that we can invent and build. Yeah. Yeah. It's an amazing ride. I hope you get a chance to do oh, it. Oh, I would love to. And, <laughs> and I was going to ask, how long does it take from all that vibration to weightlessness? And you said about nine minutes. Yeah, the, it depends which vehicle, the Apollo yeah. rocket or the shuttle. I flew the Russian rocket as well, the Soyuz on my third mm -hmm. flight. But all of them are around yeah. nine minutes. That's just to get above the air and then yeah. get going yeah. fast. It takes about nine minutes. It's just so. incredible when you said 20 math. I mean, most of us experience 0.7 math yeah. in an airplane, yeah, right? That's I right. mean, it's just unfathomable. Yeah, it, it, yeah. It's, 
It's amazing to think we just broke the speed of sound back yeah. in the 1940s. No one had ever gone faster than Mach 1 yeah. until Chuck Yeager did in the 1940s. Yeah. And now, here we are regularly going yeah. Mach 25. Yeah. The people on the space station right now live yeah. at Mach 25. It's, <laughs> uh, it's out of this world. It is, it is indeed, Literally. beyond the planet. <laughs> Speaking about childhood, next year marks the anniversary, 50th anniversary of the moon landing. Yes. And I read that when you were very young, you watched that on TV and it really marked you. Can you tell us a little bit more about the experience? Um, I, was, I was born in 1959. So in 1969, when they first landed on the moon, I was turning 10. And it was the summer of 69, just a month before my birthday. I was a little nine-year-old boy bouncing around like all nine-year-old boys. But in the background of my mind, all of the science fiction of Star Trek and 2001 A Space Odyssey and all of the books I'd been reading, it was actually coming real, where people were flying in space. Yuri Gagarin had flown, Al Shepard, John Glenn. And now people were giving a huge effort to walk on the moon. and that. That was, for me, it was like, imagine now if you'd been reading about the X-Men and then an actual X-Man went by. <laughs> and you realize this isn't pretend, this is real. This is something that's, that's not only an option for them, but therefore, it's maybe even an option for me. And so it was really persuasive in my mind of what I might want to do in life. And so that night, which was July 20th uh, in, in 1969, um, a whole bunch of us crowded into a living room because we were at a little summer cottage where not everybody had a television. We were all crowded into a room, a bunch of adults, my brother and I, everybody squeezed in watching this little black and white television. But on that black and white television with Walter Cronkite uh, announcing it all, uh, we watched Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin come down and land on the moon and then Neil climbed down the steps and, and you know, one small step for man. And I've never looked at the moon the same since. The moon is not just a light in the sky, but the moon is a place that people have been and that we're going to go again. And, and that changes your own relationship with your own future, I think. Wow, that's something that we can do. And so it, it helped me make a lot of other decisions in my life, that those people took those risks and kicked open that door uh, that had never been opened before. I read that you spent about 4,000 hours total in space. Hmm. Is that right? That's I, I didn't count equivalent them, yeah, to about, about five and uh, a half months. Yeah, about right? five and a half months total yeah. over a little yeah. under six months over three yeah. three space flights. Yeah, I think uh, someone counted it up. It's like a little over 2,600 times yeah. around the world. That's a long time. So once this space becomes endearing to you, what is it like to say goodbye the day that you're coming back to Earth? On my first two space flights, they were short. They were just construction flights. I helped build the Russian space station Mir, yeah. and on the second one, I helped build the International Space Station. Mm -hmm. So they're very almost surgical. You know, mm -hmm. get up there, do your job, work incredibly hard, fast, don't sleep, get all this stuff done, and then at the end, you go, great, we got everything done, and you come back and land. So there's a, a certain um, poetry to that because you've had a specific task and you finished all the tasks, and now it's time to come home. And there's a great sense of accomplishment and pride. But on my third space flight, I was up for over five months. And that's different. It's not a place you're visiting. It's not just one singular purpose, but it's a new place that you've lived. I mean, it was my mailing address for <laughs> half a year, you know, my postal code or whatever. Um, and you get very completely physically adapted. You mm. become very elegant in weightlessness. You're, mm -hmm. you're, you're a ballerina or a dolphin mm -hmm. or a bird. You, you don't even think about moving without gravity. Uh, you become the best gymnast in history, the elegance with which you can fly around. Mm -hmm. But you also become psychologically adapted. This is where you live. This is mm -hmm. who you are. You're, you're not an earthling. Mm -hmm. You're a spaceling. Yeah. You're not, Earth is just a planet somewhere in the distance like the moon or, or Mars. You are not there. And so there's a psychological separation and a schism away from the world. Uh, so you get very comfortable in that, very used to it, very productive. But eventually the calendar flips and you get to the day that you're coming home. I felt uh, all different emotions, naturally. I felt a great sense of accomplishment. We had, we had set records for the amount of science done on the space station. Mm -hmm. 
we had had a serious mechanical problem on the space station where we had to do an emergency spacewalk four days before we came home. But we were successful, triumphant. We saved that part of the space station. So all those years of training paid off. Um, and, and we had shared the experience with millions of people using uh, our brand new ability to, to be able to link the internet with, with life up on a spaceship. So I was extremely satisfied. I was also uh, very joyful at the opportunity to go back and see my family, you know, because all right, I'm going to be back and see my wife and my kids and, yeah. and, uh, and return to the rest of my life. But it's, it's also an end of something. And I found myself uh, 10 minutes before I had to go get into the Soyuz, pulling myself to the window and floating weightless in the window one last time, just to, to help cement in my mind what this was like. And you play with weightlessness. You, you okay. flip things around in front of you right up until the last second because yeah. it, it's magic. It, it's as if you can perform magic. You can make things fly and yeah. hover, including yourself. <laughs> but then you put on your suit, and you pull into the Soyuz, and then you're super busy flying the Soyuz back to Earth. And it's dangerous, and you haven't flown it in six months, and you have to really focus. And you're flying it in Russian, which is not my mother tongue. <laughs> so and, and working through everything. And, until eventually it's parachute open. You're crushed in your seat and doing all the things you have to do as it thunders through the atmosphere. And eventually the parachute opens and your light is a, is a thistle down, coming yeah. down. But then it bangs into the world and rolls a couple times and it's, it's a violent return, huh. kind of an abrupt return to Earth. The Russian rescue crews open up the hatch and, you know, very, very collegial, friendly, yelling at you in Russian, it's good. But they drag you out and, and, and the doctors want to measure how your body readapts. Mm -hmm. So they, they treat you very gingerly. They, they carry you for a while because yeah. they want your body to readapt slowly Pressure. and not, not instantaneously. But it's overwhelming. You're exhausted because it's been a 24 hour work day already. You're, you're now subject to gravity again, yeah. which is, uh, Heart. Uh, unfair. <laughs> yeah. And now you have to lift up your arm and your heart for the first time in six months has to lift your blood. Yeah. Your blood has weight for the first time in six yeah. months. So it's, and your balance system is messed up and, and, and it's, it's just, it's nauseating and, and sort of uh, punishing to be back to earth. But it's also lovely to be back. Wow. And, uh, and someone handed me a cell phone and yeah. I could call my wife uh -huh. and, um, and, and start the next phase of my life. It's a big, important day. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. A necessary day in the yeah. process. But, uh, but one of those days where you remember a lot of small details yeah. because it's, it's also such a, yeah. uh, an unusual day in your own life. Yeah. So you talk of all these incredible challenges that you went through. But one thing that I find fascinating is I read you suffer from vertigo. Mm -hmm. And so how do you conquer that fear as an astronaut? Well, I think, I mean, vertigo or, or a, a fear of heights, a, a sort of an involuntary, you know, leg shaking, stomach melting kind of fear of heights. Uh, I don't know how you feel, but when I stand on a balcony where the railing is really low, yeah. or if I'm standing next to a cliff, my body is giving me all the signals it can to don't do this, back yeah, away, sure. stop that. Yeah. You're, because realistically, one little mistake or, or one little gust of wind or somebody just bumps me and guaranteed you're dead. So I think it's, a, it's not an unreasonable thing to be afraid of. I think it's a natural and healthy fear to have. The real question in life is, what do you do with your fear? Because you could say, I'm afraid of heights and therefore I'm never going to go up high. But where do you draw the line? I mean, would you go up in a 10 story building? Would you ride up an elevator? Would you climb a ladder? Would you, you know, are you gonna spend your whole life lying on the ground? What I've obviously decided, and most people do, is that it's okay to be up high, so long as you know you can't fall. Hmm. Like if you're inside a 10 story building, yeah, you're, you're 10 stories up, but you're not about to fall 10 stories because there's a floor underneath you. If you're in an airplane, you might be uh, 10 kilometers up, but if you have wings underneath you, then you're not going to suddenly fall out of the sky. And on a spaceship, in fact, you're floating weightless. You can let go and you don't fall. You can't fall. It's impossible to fall from a spaceship. 
So, so long as you know that you cannot fall, yeah. then there's actually nothing to be afraid of. And that's the big difference, is how do you take the things that you have a primitive animal fear mm -hmm. about and then think about them reason. and recognize, okay, I, I feel fear, but you know, even though I'm standing in the edge of a cliff, if I'm wearing a super strong, robust harness and it's bolted to the wall behind me and there's absolutely no way I can fall, then it doesn't matter and I no longer need to be afraid. I, I don't just have to be a, a thoughtless animal. I'm a thinking human. And that's how I deal with, uh, with my particular version of vertigo. And that's what has allowed me to, uh, to, to go so incredibly high in my life uh, as a result. I know that many children around the world dream with becoming an astronaut. So what would you say to them? How can they make their dream a reality? I think the most important first step is to have a dream. What do you dream about being? When, you, when you're really honest with yourself, if you think, boy, if my life goes perfectly, who could I be? What could I grow up to be? Have that close to your heart and use that sort of to shape all of the things you choose to do. What, what book should I read? What movie should I watch? What food should I eat? You know, which things should I learn about? Because that's what I'm dreaming of being. And if you dream about being an astronaut, if you dream about being an astronaut, then there are three probably really important things. Number one is you, you need a healthy body. So think about what you exercise a little bit. So if you want to be an astronaut, number one, uh, take care of your body. The second is spaceships are complicated. And flying spaceships is very complicated. And so you're going to need to understand complicated things. So plan to go and study complicated things like, like you did studying something really complex at a very high level, uh, plan to get an advanced university degree, and, and not in something that's just easy for you, but something that really makes you think. Challenging. So the second thing is plan to have an advanced technical education in something that's interesting to you. The third, learn how to make decisions and stick with them. Uh, it's easy just to say, oh, it's above my pay grade, or oh, somebody else will decide, and just sort of bounce through life. But I, I think it's, it's very important to make decisions, little ones, and stick with them. Because decision making is kind of a skill. You get good at it. OK, I make a decision, and for the next month, I'm going to do this. Next year, I'm going to do this. Next 10 minutes, I'm going to do this, whatever. Learn how to make decisions and stick with them. And if you can have a, a healthy, strong body, uh, an advanced, complicated, uh, trained, technical mind, and the ability to make decisions and stick with them, You'll be well on your way to, uh, to walking on Mars, no, or, or really doing anything you want. Chris, of all the lessons that you learned when going to space, which ones would you highlight? I think there are a couple things that, uh, once you get over just the excitement of flying in space and the coolness of, of weightlessness and spacewalking and such, there are a few fundamental ideas in there that are really important. One of them is, uh, how do you deal with fear in your life? Do you let it keep you from doing things? Do you just say, oh, I'm afraid of that. Like, I'm afraid of flying. That's, that's a reasonable decision to make, but that means you're never going to fly anywhere. So I think understanding the difference between danger and fear is really important. They're not synonymous. Danger is just a thing. Fear is your reaction. And they don't have to be the same thing. I mean, I assume you know how to ride a bicycle. Yes. Uh, you, you weren't born knowing how to ride a bicycle. And when you were little and you were learning to ride a bicycle, you were fearful because you didn't know how yet. It was mm -hmm. you, you had the uh, of crashing and breaking a tooth or breaking your head or something. So learning to ride a bicycle is hard at first, and it makes you scared and fearful. But after a while, um, you know how to ride a bicycle, and, and you're good at it. And, and after that, it, it would seem silly to be afraid. Are you afraid of riding a bicycle? afraid of riding a bicycle, but the bicycle didn't change. The bicycle's exactly as dangerous as it always was. It's just you changed who you were. The danger is the same, but you are no longer afraid. Things aren't scary. Just people get scared. Mm. And so I think it's a really worthwhile thing to look at in your own life is what are you afraid of? And how is that changing the decisions that you're making in your life? And if those decisions are important to you, like riding a bicycle or flying in space or whatever, getting married or changing jobs or whatever, then try and figure out what's the actual danger. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
not just your animal fear. And if it's a danger that you can do something about, like gaining your skills, the ultimate, for me, the ultimate antidote for fear is competence. Change your level of competence. And if you become good at something, then you don't need to be afraid of it. And then maybe you, don't, you can include it in your own life and, and enrich in your own yeah. life. So I, and flying a spaceship is the ultimate exaggeration. The most dangerous thing I've done in my whole life yeah. was to fly a rocket ship. Yeah. The odds of dying on my first rocket launch, on the space shuttle launch, were one in 38 when wow. you do the statistics now that yeah. the rocket is, that program is over. So <laughs> accepting and facing up to a certain danger in order to do something that is worthwhile to you and changing your own skills to be able to deal with it, to me, that's a really important thing to learn in life. In order to, to be an astronaut, uh, it takes time. You might decide to be an astronaut like I did when you're nine, but nobody's gonna let you be an astronaut when you're nine years old because you <laughs> have no idea what you're doing. And you need to gain a lot of skills along the way. So you have to decide to do something that is going to take a tremendously long amount of time and that probably will never happen at the end. That, that's the life of an astronaut. I'm gonna to decide to turn myself into an astronaut. It'll probably never happen. And it'll take 25 years, mm -hmm. but I'm gonna do it anyway. That is a hard thing for most people to, to stay at, to, yep. to keep a sense of purpose. How do you stay motivated? How do you, how do you not lose uh, momentum or lose hope? How do you deal with setbacks? Because over, whatever, 25 years, there are gonna be all sorts of setbacks, medical ones, uh, life ones, uh, policy ones, technical ones. Uh, and when I was training, well, training myself to be an astronaut, there was one of the shuttle accidents, Challenger yeah. in 19, or 1986, January of 86. And I thought, oh gosh, the whole program's over. You know, I didn't have anything to do with it, but I thought there's no way I'm ever gonna be an astronaut. So I think an important uh, necessity in order to fly in space is to find a way to maintain uh, a sense of purpose and a direction to your life mm -hmm. even though it takes a long time and it's probably never going to get to the end and the way that i do that is i don't wait until the end to feel successful i i don't say i hate what i'm doing this year and i don't like doing all this stuff and no one cares and this is going to take forever and the only time i'm going to be happy is 22 years from now when i walk on the moon if you wait until you walk on the moon, then even walking on the moon won't be fun because yeah. it won't turn out the way you want it. The key is to have that long-term goal to help decide what to do with your life, to help decide what to do next. Okay. How should I spend this week? What courses should I take this year? What should I do this summer? What movie should I watch tonight? Have that long-term goal, but then celebrate every step along the way. Yeah. If you set out this next weekend, let's, I, I don't know what your goals are, but let's say your goal was to, to discover life on Enceladus, you know, one of the moons of, um, of Saturn. And, and so you say, gosh, I would love to discover life on Enceladus, but this weekend, I, I'm not going to be able to, but how about if this weekend I learn everything we know about the oceans of Enceladus? If I get into the, all the literature and, the, and all of the work that NASA has done and the European Space Agency and everything National Geographic has written, and I just immerse myself this weekend in what is the actual makeup of the oceans of Enceladus. Mm -hmm. By Sunday night, you have not discovered life on Enceladus. You're, you're not one meter closer to Enceladus, mm -hmm. but you have gotten yourself a little closer to what you're dreaming about. You have changed who you were. On Sunday night, you're not the same woman you were on Friday afternoon. Mm -hmm. And you can celebrate that, going, hey, I didn't, I didn't go to Enceladus, but you would not believe what I learned this weekend. You would not believe what I know now mm -hmm. and how it's helped repurpose yeah. myself. I think it's important to try and, and lower your personal bar of victory as low as you possibly can, so that you allow yourself to feel victorious every, every single day. day. Well, there, it's kind of up to you whether you yeah. feel a failure or feel a victory. Yeah. Nobody else really cares what you're doing. Yeah. Your, your mom sort of tries to, but, you, <laughs> but really, you know, it's kind of up to you. Mm -hmm. So don't let other people tell you when you're a success. Allow yourself, in pursuit of those long-term goals, to have as many daily or weekly or interim yeah. successes as possible. And then your life feels, instead of like it's going nowhere, that in fact it's sort of building momentum.
that you're constantly accomplishing things, that you're, you're turning yourself into who you're dreaming yeah. of being. Without that, I, I don't know how I ever could have endured all of, of the work to become the astronaut that I eventually am. In your book, you state, uh, talking about this, that you know, only a very small percentage of people who train to be astronaut will actually go out in space. Right. And so the important thing is to learn how to think like an astronaut. Yes. The journey is what matters. Sure. What does it mean to think like an astronaut? There's no magic uh, line that you step across where bef before this time you were one person and now suddenly you're an entirely different person. Becoming an astronaut, becoming um, whatever you're doing, is almost always uh, an evolution, mm -hmm. a, a transitional process. In order to, uh, to think like an astronaut, um, there, there are a couple really key, key factors. Number one is, um, is to have a purpose to your life. What am I trying to do here? What does success look like? If my life goes perfectly, five years from now, what will I be doing? It probably won't go perfectly, but if I don't know what I'm trying to do, if I don't know what perfection looks like, then how can I decide what to do right now to get there? If I don't know where I'm going, how do I choose what to do next? Mm -hmm. And the life of an astronaut, because of the, of the complexity of what we're asked to do, is a very purposeful life. It, you know that, whatever, eight years hence, you are going to have to fly this spaceship. So, man, I know what I got to do this weekend. I got to learn about the, whatever, the temperature control system of the Soyuz. I have to learn these things because it's life or death. But that, the, the fundamental precept behind that of having uh, a purpose to your decision making in pursuit of the things that are important to you, I think that's a really fundamental necessity in thinking like an astronaut. Uh, the other is that almost everything we take for granted is as a result of human ingenuity. Mm -hmm. I mean, I grew up in, in Canada. As a human being, you could not live in Canada. We're, 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 we're naked apes. We're not physiologically capable of living in Canada, except in the summertime. The winter would kill us. But we've invented clothing. We've invented shelter. We know how to start a fire. We know how to uh, prepare food and store food. And with that technology, we can live in Canada. Yeah. We can live up in the Arctic. You could live all over the world. Um, the, the recognition that human ingenuity enables quality of life yeah. and, and, and almost capability, per, permission for life. And, and so that um, both the trust, but also the relentless drive to try and understand how things work and try and get better at them. Mm -hmm. Don't just accept the status quo. Yeah. If you show an astronaut an airplane or a spaceship, they'll look at it and they'll see the strengths, but they'll also see the weaknesses and go, oh, why is that like that? And we should fix that and we should change that and let's mm -hmm. make this better next time. Sort of a relentless dissatisfaction yeah. with the, our, our current limited understanding of how everything works in order to try and perpetually yeah. improve it. That's very much thinking and like an astronaut. Exactly, and that I love that you said that because it brings me to an important point. Uh, I know that you're skeptical of spiritual gurus, and I couldn't agree more with you about when they say, you know, just think positively, right. and your right. your dreams will become true. Uh, you talk about the power of negative thinking. Sure. Uh, yeah, visualizing success to me that's nice. You know, visualizing success that sort of it sets the stage. You know, okay, that's nice, but. That's not what's going to achieve success. What's going to allow you to succeed is to visualize failure. Like, what's going to go wrong? You have to, I think, realistically accept right at the beginning that things always go wrong. That's just life. Yeah. Things go wrong. Hardly anything goes perfectly. Watch any sporting event. Look at any month of your own life. Things did not go perfectly. Yeah. The real question of whether you might have a chance of succeeding or not is in how did you prepare for things to go wrong? Most of your life is fairly quiet. There's time. You know, there, there's hours in every day when, you know, bombs aren't going off and nobody's bleeding and it's just, it's a quiet time. Are you using that time to prepare for when things are going to go wrong or not? How do you visualize failure? And, and if you just sat down right now and said, what are the 10 most likely things to go wrong between now and the end of the year? in my mm -hmm. life. 
What are the 10? And some, the, you can make a reasonable prediction. You know, I might be in a car crash. Or might, uh, you know, my aunt may die because she, she's getting ill and she's at the end of her life or whatever. And then say, okay, if a car crash is a probability, let's look into it. Does our, is our car insured? Is, is, it, is, it, is everything good in our car right now? Are all the airbags working? If that happens, have we thought about how well we're driving? When's the last time we took a defensive driving course? Are we, are we actually getting in the car and thinking today or not? Just change, get prepared for a thing to go wrong. And if you have a family member that's getting at the end of your life, don't wait for them to die to start thinking about how you're going to deal with it. Actually sit down uh, with yourself or with your family and say, hey, it looks like whatever Aunt Louise is, is likely going to pass away soon. Let's talk about what we're going to do when that happens. It's going to happen, so let's just talk about it. Who, who are you going to phone? What sort of gifts would you like to buy? Who wants to go to the funeral? How are we going to take care of the estate? Just prepare for things to go wrong. Because then when they happen, they, they, you still grieve, you still have the problem to deal with, but you have a much better chance of dealing with it well. And if it's a spaceship that you're getting ready for, then that ship's trying to kill you all the time. And if you're not ready for it, it will kill you if you have not prepared for failure. So there's an, a great power in negative thinking, mm -hmm. but not to depress you. Yeah. In fact, the opposite. You can now go, hey, the rest of the year, I've got the top 10 things and I'm ready for them all. Come on, bring it on, world. I'm, I'm ready. I'm, I'm, I'm calm. I'm confident. You're not just going, man, I hope those 10 things don't happen because I'm not ready for them. Yeah. I would much rather go through life having prepared, prepared in the yeah. quiet time for the probable things that are going to fail. Uh, and even then, if something fails you weren't ready for, you still have a lot more breadth and scope of capability to deal with it because you've prepared for those yeah. other things. So I, I, it, it's, it's thinking like an astronaut, yeah. but it's also uh, when I was a fighter pilot and a test pilot, an engineer, it's sort of all one long continuum uh, of how to prepare for the inevitability yeah. of failure and how to optimize, therefore, your chances of, of you know, doing it as well as you can. It's such a refreshing attitude in today's world, so I very <laughs> much appreciate it. It works for astronauts, for sure. <laughs> uh, one other thing you mentioned is, as a strategy for success, you learn how to be a zero. Ah. What did you mean by that? When I was a young man, uh, I was a pilot, I became a fighter pilot. Here I am, a fighter pilot, a single seat, very powerful airplane, and I'm fighting in the Cold War. I'm intercepting Soviet bombers off North America. It requires arrogance. It requires a strong self-confidence, a, a competence. It takes a certain mental attitude to be ready to go do that thing. But that attitude that allows you to be a good fighter pilot going into battle is not necessarily the right attitude for everything that you're going to do in your life. Um, and something I thought about and then learned and then tried to incorporate in my life as I got a little bit older was when you come into a new situation, which happens fairly often, you walk into a new store, you meet a person, uh, uh, something changes in your life, how do you react to a new set of circumstances? And if you're that brash young fighter pilot who's confident about everything, you go, I don't know what's going on, but I'm pretty sure I'm good at this and I'm going to start making decisions. Um, you, you're sure you're a positive influence. You, you're confident. I'm a positive. I'm a plus one here. But everybody around you knows, who is this guy? He has no idea about the nuance of what's happening. He doesn't understand the subtleties of this environment. He's telling us what to do. He just got here. He's not a, a plus one. This is a minus one. This is a negative. We not only have to deal with the regular problems, now we got to deal with this guy. And so something I learned as an astronaut was when you're coming into a new situation, uh, try and come in neutral. Try and come in as a zero. Don't try and immediately change everything with your limited perception of what's going on. Give yourself time to notice what's happening. When you walk into a new situation, consciously say, I'm going to try and enter into this without a ripple and learn about it. And then once I've got a feel for what's happening, then start trying to contribute in a positive way. Now, you can't do that if the building is on fire. If the building is on fire, you need to come in and start rescuing people. You just have to act. But the building is hardly ever on fire. And some people act like the building's always on fire. Mm. And, and so I think aiming to be a zero sounds silly. It's an easy way to remember it, that's all. But 
deliberately coming into a new situation say, today, I'm going to aim to be a zero for a while until I get the hang of this thing. And then maybe I'll be one of the people that knows something that can contribute to being a positive in this room. Or maybe I'm just going to stay as a zero because I don't know what I'm doing here. You know, if I walk into a painting class, I'm, I'm never going to get above zero. I'm not, I'm not a good painter. I won't know. I, as hard as I try, I, I just don't have that talent or skill. But there are some situations where I could come yeah. in and contribute. And, and I think the, um, the, the subtlety of the environment you're moving into and the recognition of your own influence on what's going on is important to think about in advance. And, and one good way to remember it is just put in front of your mind, OK, this is new. I'll aim to be a zero for a while. And then I'll selectively yeah. try and be a plus one if I can. You talk about uh, painting not being your forte. Right. but. You are quite talented musically. I mean, we all watched that David Bowie Space Oddity yeah. rendition, which was amazing. Um, so, you know, historically, we've uh, known the movement of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, mm -hmm. and how important it is. But in more recent years, people have added the A for right. STEAM, the sure. arts. arts. Yeah. Uh, what do you think about that inclusion? One of the great science fiction writers said, um, Specialization is for insects. We're humans. We can do a lot of different things. <laughs> and I thought it was a nice way to express the thought of science, uh, which is just sort of like organized curiosity, science, trying to explain the complexity of the universe around us. And technology, these are the things we invent to try and increase our ability to do things. And engineering, that's all the math that's behind the, the technology. And, and then, of course, math itself, the, the pure um, theoretical understanding of all that. Science, technology, engineering, and math, they underpin everything. They made the clothes we're wearing. They turned these lights on. They made this black stuff behind us. Those four things are vital for an advanced, or, or at least the opportunity for an advanced quality of life. But if that's all you have, then you're a robot. Robots need STEM, but they sure don't need the arts. But on board the spaceship, floating there weightless, is a guitar. And it's not there for science or technology or engineering or math. It's there because in order to stay mentally healthy, you need the arts. We're human beings. Uh, some of the oldest link we have with our forebears are the cave paintings in the south of Europe from 45,000 years ago. On the floor of a cave along the, the banks of the Rhine in southern Germany from 42,000 years ago, they picked up a musical instrument. 42,000 years ago. It's, it's the leg bone of a bird that's hollow. And so if they drilled a few holes in it, they blew in the end, and you could play a song. And that, that shows to me that art and our necessity to express our emotion and share that with other people, something beyond just words, is absolutely fundamental to being a human being to, and, and to, to, to our own, not just our physical health, but our mental I health. Know. And so it wasn't me that put a guitar up on the space station to play Space Oddity. It was the NASA psychiatrists. They put a guitar really? up on the space station because they recognized that in that bubble of all the science and math and technology, there are people who are trying to live. And so we have astronauts who are singers and painters um, Alan Bean, who walked on the moon, was a wonderful painter, and, and poets, and, and musicians, and, and it's absolutely necessary. And it's, it's true right across education. It's true right across the population, yeah. not just on spaceships. Yeah. But um, we need the technology that allows us to live well. But if your time is going to be freed up, which technology does, then what are you going to do with that time? And that's where the pursuit of art and the imaginative capabilities of the human mind. That's where the real joy and delight and, and variety of life is. And so uh, I think STEM is important, but uh, the necessity to recognize the completeness of STEAM and, and the yeah. arts in that yeah. is equally as important. Chris, one of the things that I most admire about you is that you take education very seriously. Hmm. And the internet is full of videos of you explaining how, yeah, to, how you brush works. your teeth, how yeah, you sure. sleep in space, and all that. In fact, when you were in the International Space Station, you launched a, an education initiative 
called Launch uh, from the Pad, yeah. where you talked th uh, through Skype with kids. Yeah, on the launch pad. Right. On the launch pad. What was like their, the most common uh, issue that they wanted to know about? After I got back from space, I was sitting at my desk, and it was lunchtime, and I was eating a sandwich, and I had the internet up in front of me. And I realized there are kids in schools all across the world who are eating their sandwiches, and they have internet in their schools. Why am I not taking this lunch hour to just tie in using you know, Skype or, or FaceTime or something and just talk to the kids while I'm eating my lunch? Why not? It's, it's easy, we got that technology. So I just, I invented this thing called on the lunch pad, you know, like on the launch pad. And, and then just, and there's no, no formality to it. Just someone says, okay, at this time you're gonna call. And I call in, so if I have 31 minutes, I could spend 30 minutes with the kids. Doesn't take any preparation, they prepare questions. And I would have loved when I was nine years old to talk to someone who had already walked in space and be able to ask them direct questions. Because I really think education is important. Letting people see what's beyond the horizon they've seen so far. How do you know what you wanna be if you haven't seen what all the choices are? You know, how do you decide? Uh, and so education is where you can push back the edges of your ignorance and see further over the horizon. And so I've been involved in education my whole life. I work on the Canadian Children's Literacy Foundation. Uh, I produce a whole series on YouTube called Rare Earth about interesting stories from around the world. I did an entire uh, online training course called Masterclass. I teach at the University of Waterloo. I, um, I work with a technology incubator to try and bring ideas to the fore. To me, they're all the same thing. And that is try and let people see beyond what they've seen so far, pique their curiosity, give them some information, that will allow them to see that, hey, this is something I'm interested in. Get people to be explorers and scientists on their own through the, uh, the means of, of education. And I think it's really important and it's something yeah. I do pretty much every day. And thank you for mentioning all the different science communication initiatives that you've been a part of because people will certainly want to know more about you. Well, I, I, I think it's important, especially when you've had a, a rare an experience yeah. as an astronaut. There's so few of us. Yeah. Uh, there are far more people playing in football in Spain than there are have ever flown in space, you know, <laughs> just professional football. It's, yeah. it's, um, it's still a very rare human experience. And so I feel uh, a responsibility to share it as well as I possibly can, not just keep it to myself. Yeah. You know? Chris, I want to ask you sort of a deeper question, how has being in outer space changed your perspective about humanity? From the spaceship, you can take pictures of the world naturally. There's some big, there's one big window, it's a meter across, and it bulges out. And so naturally, I was, when I was in the window, I would take pictures of the world. And I could send them down to people and, and say, hey, look at this great picture I took, you know, it's really cool. Um, but then after a while, I was like, well, what do people want me to take a picture of? And, and there was Twitter on board. So I sent a note on Twitter basically saying, hey, everybody, what do you want me to take a picture of? And it was so f delightful that the answer that came back from all around the planet was, I want a picture of my hometown. <laughs> and at first that made me kind of laugh. Okay, you, you just want a picture of yourself. But then I thought about it. Why does everybody, no matter where they're from in the world, want a picture of their hometown? Number one, they're proud of who they are. They love where they live. This is who they are. They define themselves. This is my home town. But also, they want to see how they fit in in comparison to the rest of the world. They want to see how their particular little um, version of life fits in with all the other versions of life around the world. And the commonality of the response, the, the shared nature of being human, is something that really got firmly cemented in my mind going around and around the world thousands of times to come over a little town that I used to live in, a standard little Canadian town. And when you look at it, you know, it's got a downtown, it's got a railway, it's got a bunch of roads, it's got the suburbs, it's got farms around it. It's, you know, it's, it's at an airport somewhere. It's a town. And then 15 minutes later, you're over Northern Africa and you look down and there's exactly the same town. In a country, I, I'm not even sure you know, whether it's Mauritania or what I'm looking at, I don't know this town, but it's exactly the same. And 40 minutes later, you're over Australia. And that sense of, of that we're all in this together, 
and we're all just trying to solve the same problems uh, in pretty much the same way. We're raised with different cultures and different languages, different religions, um, different traditions, but the, the fundamental nature of being a human being is, is so completely shared all mm. around the world. And you can build up a tremendous sense of, of difference living in one place. You can, the rest of the world, I don't know, those imaginary, horrible, dumb, crazy, mean, whatever you want, but you've never even seen them or been there. And you can start to think that yours is the only way to solve problems, mm -hmm. or yours is the best the way best. to do everything. Because without a comparison, what else would you think? Um, and that's part of the reason that I'm speaking with you, and part of the reason that I've written books about it and taken so many pictures, is I've been lucky enough to actually see the world for what it truly is. To go around it 2,650 times, it's very difficult to maintain the facade of difference. And, and, and you realize that, yeah, these people grew up with a different religion and a different language, but they just want the same thing. They want a little joy in their life. They want comfort. They want to live a full natural life. They want their children to have a slightly better life than they did. They want laughter, you know, it's, it's the same. And, and so I think the, uh, the joining nature of, uh, of life itself is something that somehow uh, irreversibly seeps into you as you float weightless and stare through the window of a spaceship. One important question that comes to mind, Chris, is some people are a little bit uh, apprehensive about investing in space exploration. Sure. They say, with so many problems to solve on Earth, why are we uh, trying to explore space? What would you say to them? As an astronaut, I ask myself every single year, is this worth the money? Are we doing the right thing? There are, there are people hungry. There are people in parts of the world that have tremendous problems, some of which could be solved financially or just with straight time and effort. And so I think it's an important question you should always ask yourself, no matter what your job is. Am I doing the right things for my own value system and for the society that supports me? So one way to look at it is, why are we spending all that money when we could be spending the money here? So I'm from Canada, so I, I, I dug into the budget. How much money are we actually spending? And when you talk billions, then I, I, I can't in, for the life of me visualize what a billion is. It's such a big number. But if I just knock off a bunch of zeros and bring it down and say, like for every thousand dollars our government spends, how much are we spending? Are we, is it the right proportion? And in Canada, for every thousand dollars we spend, I forget what, it's like two hundred and forty dollars is on health and welfare, so almost a quarter, which is a lot for health and welfare of our people, and uh, a fraction of one percent is for exploring hmm. the, the universe. It's like it's like three cents out of every thousand dollars. So we could say, why are we wasting all that money on the space program? And we could take that three cents and apply it to the $240 that we're spending on health and welfare. And that might be the right thing to do. But then any kid who is already being taken care of by our health system, who's inspired to, to be an astronaut or be an astronomer or a physicist, uh, they have to leave Canada to go do it because we have not included that in our program. And every country has to go through the same decision making process. Should Spain be part of the European Space Agency? Should they have their own space agency? What, what's the right balance of expense versus benefit? Of the science and technology that gets invented, of the scientific understanding of the universe that comes, and of the motivation and inspiration of our children that comes from having that program within our own country or within their own reach? And I think you should ask that question. But I have yet to have someone come up to me who says, why do we waste all that money in space when we could be spending it on problems worth, who actually knows how much we spend. Hmm. It's a perception without any facts. So I ask all of those people, how much do we spend on health and welfare in our province or our country? And how much do we spend on the space program? And if you don't know the answer to the question, then you have no objection. Once you have the numbers and, and you, you truly have a plan, then, then I'm happy to have a discussion with it. But I think we do a pretty good job. I think the balance is about right. You can measure the quality of life any way you like. The, the quality of life for our species has never been better in history. Mm -hmm. Average lifespan, levels of education, infant mortality, death from disease, 
uh, opportunity to pursue things is sure not perfect everywhere in the world. Of course. But as an average, we've never done better. So yeah, there's always room to make mm -hmm. it better. But meanwhile, we're also exploring and understanding the earth and the universe around us. And the whole question is one of balance. And do we draw the line in the right place? And I've convinced myself every single year when I look into it that, yep, I think we're still, we're still yeah. doing the right. Chris, this has been an incredible conversation. I know that I will remember it for the rest of my life. It's been so. lo lovely to speak with you. Thanks very much. <laughs> Can you give us a last message for all the children and parents and teachers that are going to watch this interview? Especially for a young person, but really for anybody, it's important to remember that you still have the rest of your life. And you're going to turn yourself into something different, especially for a child. You're going to turn yourself, you're going to grow up to be something, or you're going to grow older to be something. So the real question is, how involved are you in shaping yourself to be who you're going to be? Are you just going to let life sort of just choose? The random events of things happening sort of inadvertently mold you into the person that you're going to be, which you can do. You can just say, eh, whatever, I'll let life choose. Or you can take sort of an active role. Hey, I just don't want it to be random. I want to change who I am deliberately. I want to get stronger. I want to get more educated. I, I want to change who I am so that I have a better chance of turning myself into that person that I would like to be. I think maybe the most important message I'd like to leave people with is to take an active role in creating who you are. Don't just be passive in your own life. You only get one. Be involved in it. Deliberately try and constantly improve who you are. Never be satisfied with who you are right now. Always be looking to, to improve who you are so that maybe in the future you can even be one of those people that you just dream about. And I'm, I'm living proof that it, it is amazing what can happen. Thank you very much, Chris. My pleasure. Lovely to speak with you.